So we're going to finish this training with a small Unified Manager demo in which we will uh, look at capacity and performance. First we'll run uh, reports and set up a report schedule. Then we'll create a performance threshold policy and connect it to an alert so that an email will be sent when the threshold is breached. And obviously that will also generate event messages and we can manage these alerts that were generated. So let's have a look at that. So let's first have a look at reporting. What we'll do is we'll generate a report. We will also schedule a report. So first we connect to Unified Manager. We directly go to Reports. So we select Reports. We collapse uh, this screen. So we collapse everything and we see we have different types of reports that we can run. Now I'm going to go for the Capacity Utilization Reports. For example, we can run a report of the aggregate capacity. That will take a while. It will generate all of the information. You see that we have four aggregates. It reports that there is a total capacity and there is a used data capacity, also the percentage used, and a lot more information, all having to do with capacity of the aggregates. So, for example, the space full threshold, and it predicts that it will be 29 days and 6 days before the aggregates are full, and there's a lot more information. Now, if you want to have this information sent to you on a scheduled basis, then you can run and manage report schedules. So, for example, I say the schedule name is daily uh, aggregates. So, I want to have a report of the aggregates daily. A recipient email address is my email address, for example. And I can choose any of these formats. So, I could have a comma-separated uh, list. I go for the PDF and I want it daily, and the time will be 12 o'clock at night. So my report will be generated and sent to me every night. Now I have to select what I want to see, so I say the aggregate capacity and utilization. When I save this schedule, now it says the schedule was edited successfully, and that will send me a report every night. And we're done. Next thing we do is we will set up a performance threshold policy, create an alert for that. So first we go to the performance thresholds, we run create. So we want to create a threshold that has to do with the volumes. So we go to volume, we name the policy IO operations per second for the volumes and we leave the description for what it is. We have to select a counter. So the counter will be I operations per second. The warning is 80 and the critical is 90. If these two thresholds are breached, then we will get an alert. It has to be in that state for five minutes or more before the alert will be generated. Now it tells us that we have to go to the configuration alerting page to create the alert. So we have the policy set up. Now we go to the alerting page which is, so there's the IOPS per volume, and we go to the alerting page, and we add an alert. The alert should be for the resource volume again, so we select volume. We want the alert to be generated for the XVOL and the YVOL, if necessary. So we do that. Now we have to select the event as well and the event should be the IOPS critical threshold breached. So if that is the case, then there will be an alert generated for XVOL and or YVOL. Now it forces me to enter a name. So the alert name will be obviously something like IOPS for volumes. Again, it says I'm not going to do this because I also need an email address. So that will send an alert to me when the I operations thresholds are breached. I can decide that I want to have this alert every 15 minutes or only once. So I go for once and the alert is added successfully. Now I have to connect this uh, policy to the volumes that I want to run it for. So I select YVOL and XVOL. Then I can go to Assign, so there's no threshold policy connected. So as I assign the threshold policy, 
that I just generated. So this will connect this uh, policy to these two volumes. So now whenever there is a problem with the IOPS, I will be alerted via email. So everything is set up correctly. So first you create a performance threshold policy, then you create an alert for that policy, and the last thing you have to do is you have to connect that particular policy to one or more volumes. So we have been drinking some coffee or something like that, and we get back, and when we look, we see we have problems. Um, now we have a problem with clusters, with SVMs, with the volumes, so obviously something is definitely wrong. Now what I can do is, uh, first of all, this is uh, something which is common in simulators because we have no storage failover capacity. That means that there will be an error message for that or a warning uh, that there is a risk, and which is obvious because we have no shared storage. Okay. Then we have some capacity risks because it says, well, there is some snapshotting going on and that's not really nice. But what is worse is that we have some incidents and it says there is a threshold policy which is breached and that is the same for the XVOL. So XVOL and YVOL are both in trouble, IO-wise. So we can have another look at it by looking at the volumes. So we select the volumes and it says YVOL and uh, XVOL both have a problem. So this is alarming, right? So we go to the events and the events will tell us that there is a volume IOPS critical threshold which is breached. So it's gone past the warning and it has reached critical. So obviously there are more than 90 IOPS that are generated to these volumes, which is obvious because 90 of course is nothing. I just want to demonstrate that you can have your errors and this is the reason why the alert was generated. And obviously I also should have it in my mail. Now what we can do is we can go to the events again and we can select these two events and then say okay I acknowledge that and if I don't want to see them at all anymore I can say I'm going to mark them as resolved. I could do that for all of these messages and I'm, I've got a clean system again. It doesn't take away the problem though and we're done. And last but not least I would like to discuss 10 things that may be worth considering. Some of these uh, considerations may seem pretty obvious, but I've often seen that quick decisions are made without considering results. And if that happens, then you may pose yourself with performance problems you sometimes will have difficulty in fixing, uh, fixing later. Now, some of these considerations are not related to Waffle per se, but I thought it would be nice to put them in here anyway. The first one is that you should not add disks to an existing aggregate if the existing disks do not have the same speed as the new disks. So that means that, for example, I once had a customer that wanted to add disks with 15,000 RPM to an aggregate that was fully populated with 7,000 um, RPM disks. And this is something that you should never do because the, the performance of the aggregate is determined by the slowest disks in the aggregate. So in such a case, it would be better to create a new aggregate for the faster disks and then move some of the volumes to that new aggregate. So that will free up your older aggregate and then when you buy more disks later on, you can grow the fast aggregate and move more volumes until you have moved all the volumes to the new faster aggregate. And then you can get rid of that slow aggregate. Second one is, in quality of service groups, you should use items of the same type. So volumes should be combined with other volumes in the same group, and LUNs with LUNs, etc. It might even be an idea to consider combining volumes that have the same access patterns. Uh, the more equal the players in a quality of service group are, the better will the performance between the items in the policy group be. The third one, make sure Number three, make sure that all players in your environment have the same maximum transfer unit size when you consider networking. So if your switches and, for example, the VMware environment use an MTU size of 9000, then it is not advisable to have your network ports in the nodes at 1500. Keep in mind that MTU size is determined at the broadcast domain level in your IP spaces. So if you really have to have two different speeds to two different environments, 
it might be worth considering to create multiple broadcast domains with different MTU sizes. And another item that should be considered is what to do with different NAS protocols. Should you combine NFS and SIFS on the same ports? Or should you split the two protocols uh, between different ports? NetApp's best practice is to, instead of splitting the protocols across different physical ports, actually you should combine these ports into something which is called an interface group. This is better for performance and better for redundancy. Um, Number five, with regards to deduplication, it always was pretty important to consider what you should do with creating volumes. Do you want to create multiple smaller volumes or just a couple of larger volumes? For deduplication, it would be better to have a larger volume, but this is not always beneficial to your flexibility. Moving smaller volumes around to other aggregates is a lot easier than with bigger volumes and also restoring backups to smaller volumes has advantages over bigger volumes because of speed obviously and if you run an all flash environment you could consider enabling cross volume deduplication so running smaller volumes should not be a problem anymore number six at the aggregate level it is still true that you should keep your raid groups equal in size so if you want to add disks, make sure that you get a new RAID group that is equal to the other RAID groups in the aggregate. And please remember that once you add disks to an aggregate, they will be in there until they break or until you destroy the aggregate. Removing disks from an aggregate is not an option. Number seven, grow your aggregate before it's nearly full. Simply keep track of the capacity of your aggregates. You can do that using reporting and alerting in, in Unified Manager as well as in NA Box. Do not wait until your aggregate is full because then you will obviously drop in performance, no doubt because writing to five RAID groups is better than writing to a single new RAID group when you grow the aggregate. Number eight, consider location of your volumes with respect to the location of your lifts. NetApp says that the performance loss uh, you have when accessing a LIF on, for example, node 1, whilst the volume is hosted by node 4, is negligible. But something which is negligible is not the same as something which is not there. So keep in mind that if you write to a volume that is hosted by another node, then the data is not managed by the node with the LIF, but will only be acknowledged once it is in the NVRAM of the node that hosts the volume. So there will, obviously, there will always be a performance penalty. It could be negligible, but it's better to have your volumes at the same node as where you have your lifts. Be careful with your scheduled deduplication and compression runs. Do not run them during peak hours, if possible. Not all efficiency can be run in memory, so there will always be quite some I.O. when you run compression, etc. in the background. So be aware of that. And finally, make sure that you have a baseline. So in OnCommand Unified Manager, as well as in NA Box, you can generate alerts when IOPS or latency or other counters breach certain levels. As with all the other texts in this training, you can download the uh, considerations as a PDF as well. Um, for now, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, remarks or suggestions, please let me know. Bye for now. Thank you.